Welcome to the Trading Movies Podcast. I'm Janaid. I'm Omar. And today we are going to be talking about the Pelican Brief. But Omar, before we get into that, it's been about a week since we last met to record. So there's been a lot of stuff happening in the movie industry. Uh, But before we get into that, actually, what did you watch this weekend? Well, I started and finished season one of The White Lotus. Impressive. Which um, was recommended to me by who? By my brother and sister-in-law. Shout out Ali Eriman. <laughs> um, but um, I, I hadn't heard much about it, to be honest. I just knew it was, it was an HBO show. Thought, so right when I see that, I think, okay, this could be some good quality there. Yeah. And um, it hooked me from the first episode. I was interested. It's a very, it's a, they call it an anthology series, which I think um, refers a lot to um, like a drama-based, quirky um kind of um very character based show. Yeah, so I think I think yeah. when they say anthology they also mean like it'll be follow the same themes but it might be in a different setting. So yes. if I understand correctly, this show was created because of the pandemic. So they called up this guy, Mike White, who fun fact, used to be on Survivor, and they're like, "Hey, we need a show for the pandemic. You got to shoot in one place, minimum cast, and it's just the same people." So he pumped the show out during the pandemic. And it was blockbuster, and that's why he got a second season. That's so the second season is in another. If I believe I remember reading correctly, it's in Italy. So it's yes, different, it's in a so different. So I started season two. Yeah, so it's in a white yeah. lotus somewhere else. Exactly, yeah. it's white lotus somewhere else. I've seen since episode one of season two, so just started it. But yeah, I thought it was a great watch. Uh, anyone who's thinking about watching it, hasn't heard of it, or has heard of it and just hasn't gone into it, I would I would recommend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So interestingly enough, after our conversation last week, Netflix decided to listen to us and released a murder mystery. Uh, the Pale Blue Eye with um, uh, with Christian Bale. Christian Bale and Henry Melling, who I don't know if you know who Henry Melling is, but he's Dudley Dursley from the Harry Potter movies. Oh, and he's okay. a really, yes. he's a really good actor in this movie. Like surprisingly, he does a really good job. Uh, it's a decent movie. You can check my Letterboxed uh, review of it. It's it's definitely there's a couple of twists. The last twist at the end is definitely interesting. Uh, I enjoyed it. I don't know if I'll watch it again, but for a first time watch, it definitely definitely kept you interested, particularly for people like us who like mysteries. Yes. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's an interesting one because I, I I feel like I've seen the trailer for that movie. I checked the ratings the other day and it got it has decent ratings. I think. Yeah, it takes place in the 1830s yeah. at um, the U.S. Military Academy. I think it's it's in Virginia. Yeah. And essentially, a student dies, and then they have to look into what how why and all of the stuff behind the murder but then there's a bigger conspiracy as there always is and yeah there's a couple of twists as well i, I want to give it away in case because it's still pretty new it's only like four or five days old so i don't want to give it away but uh there's a twist at the end i think you would be engaged by interesting okay yeah so i will i will i will actually check that out the pale blue eye is that my homework for next week huh no no, no. It's, not, no it's, <laughs> it's your turn to assign homework. actually it is my yeah, turn yeah. to assign homework uh, yeah but well, uh, let's let's shift gears a bit and talk about a couple of new trailers that came out um, this week. So, firstly, Ant Man, um, the trailer came out. It's going to come out in February. The film. Yep. Uh, one thing I will I wanted to mention after our conversation last week is the CGI does not hit once you watched Avatar: Way of Water. Like, yeah. I'm looking at this trailer and I'm like, <laughs> "Where's Jimmy Cameron? You know, where's my twelve years of painstaking? You no, know, the water droplet and see yeah. here." But I like, I mean, the I, if we hadn't seen Avatar, I don't think we would complain about CGI at all. Absolutely not. Yeah. No, it's, it's his fault. He, <laughs> yes. he ruined me. But with that being said, um, CGI aside, Jonathan Majors as Kang is very intriguing. He he actually gets lines in this trailer and, and you see some action. And I'm just looking forward to seeing his star kind of rise. Yeah. Because he's, he's really, really good in this movie. What do you think about the concept the of the movie? I think it's from what we know so far. Okay, so one thing I'll say off the top. So in the trailer, there they show his daughter, Ant Man's daughter, Cassie, building a machine to mm-hmm. send a, a signal down to the quantum, quantum realm. Quantum realm. Yeah. Her dad, her adoptive grandmother and grandfather all know how bad this place is, and none of no one stopped. Like she didn't build this overnight. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It was going on for a while. No yeah. one was like, "Hey, what are you doing in there, bud?" Nope. They just let her build this, and then they suddenly find out what it is the day she announces it. Yeah, I'm sure there is a story behind there, it. Yeah, but... that's the it's from the trailer to um what it's it's the it's the is it the mom who's like 
you're sending a signal down to the quantum realm it's a, or whatever. It's, it's, so it's it's uh, Wasp's mother. Well, okay, Wasp's mother. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you're sending a signal down to quantum realm, and she, she's like, "Stop it now!" Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> After she's already. And started. I was like, you... <laughs> "But I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's." I mean, there's it's, some backstory, obviously. We don't some know. kind of secret or something. Yeah. Um. So I'm. I, I would say I've been one of the more critical people of Ant Man. Yeah. Just because I understand that Ant Man is a pure, full out entertainer. Yeah. Um, but I just. I never got into it. I saw the first one, and everyone was like, "Oh, it's funny!" And I was like, "Sure, that was funny, but like, is it really a great quality movie?" I thought it was pretty good. I like the idea of the Marvel movies. Um, yeah, like it's a Marvel movie, but then each one is uh, a different genre. So, yeah. um, Winter Soldier is kind of like their spy movie, and then Ant Man was like their heist movie. I kind of like that idea of it and that interpretation. Um, with that, with that being said he's kind of a horrible character in the comics like he does a lot of bad things okay and they've really sanitized the character <laughs> and like he's really really evil he does some evil stuff um so they've sanitized him and kind of made him more kid friendly so like uh, are you talking deadpool level no De- deadpool is still comedy this guy does like horrendous stuff oh like, really like it's he, that level he beats partners like he does bad oh, stuff. Okay. yeah yeah All it's right. not good um I would not support reading his Ultimate Marvel run. Like in in their version of the Avengers, there's a different, they're called the Ultimates. Very bad character. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyways, all of that to say, I think we spoke about this last time, but Marvel has been kind of off kilter for a bit. So this movie really needs to cement it back into bringing us to this next phase five. So we'll be be watching it regardless. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Yeah, for sure. And... Next, we're going to talk about another, you know, one of our just favorite people, James Cameron again, <laughs> uh, who recently announced that they're doing a re-release of Titanic in yeah. 4K and I think 3D as well. I mean, it's it's not it's not entirely surprising considering it's a 25 year. He just came out with Avatar. Mm-hmm. People are a little bit on the James Cameron high. Um, oh, it's gonna that. make like 250 million and i think the timing of it is really well because there's a, a bunch of people around our age who weren't old enough to watch it in the theaters necessarily exactly who yeah. are now into movies and need a reason to go back so it might draw them in. yeah because the movie's so iconic a, a whole generation that just watched it on tv or didn't even see it yet mm-hmm. um they can experience what we experienced back in 90 what 97 98 97 yeah, twenty five yeah, years, right? Yeah. Ninety seven, ninety eight, something like that. So they can they can experience that. Um, and you know, it's a smart move releasing it. In Valentine's it's coming on Valentine's Day. Yeah. And so it's it's a great, no, it's a great yeah. it's a great dinner and a movie, right? It's a great dinner and a movie, Titanic. and it's a perfect movie for. You're not gonna a you're not gonna be watch. surprised at what happens in the end. Exactly, and this is. <laughs> Wait, you're telling me that the boat doesn't make it? <laughs> There's some unknown <laughs> twist that we don't know about. Uh, so Titanic is still. Is it is it second in all time grocers after Avatar one? Yeah, I think it's second when you adjust for inflation. So I wonder where this will bring it if if. Well, if does it count as the, does it count as the same? Well, I was gonna actually ask that. Out does this count as another? I say I say count it as different because then it'll be like James Cameron, uh, <laughs> got a top ten in like twenty twenty three with Titanic after he released it a second time because you know it's gonna be in the top ten of uh, box office this year. But it has to count towards the. I think it still has to count. Doesn't not have to count towards the entire, um, towards the overall. I don't. I don't know gross of the movie because because I think it's from the nineties. I have no idea because because they re release versions of like The Godfather, for example, and stuff like that. But I don't know if it counts for like the theatrical receipts count for the original movie or if it's a separate, like yeah, a separate account. Because the same people are getting money for whatever this does. That yeah. they did in the, in the 90s. Yeah. Right? So, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure Leo will love the extra. Residuals. Yes, really, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm uh, taking another year off or something. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta do more research about this, this Playboy philanthropist and plan. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that was kind of the, the main stuff that happened that we wanted to talk about. But we wanted to also introduce a new segment to the show, which is Masala Minute. So, that's going to be the time we carve out at the top of the show to talk about anything Bollywood related. Um, that may have come out in the last week that we want to discuss. Uh, at which point, Umar, I'm going to give you the floor. What are we discussing today's in today's Masala Minute? So the much anticipated, eagerly waited for, uh, we were very, very, uh, like, wondering, is this trailer going to come out? Because the, the movie is about two weeks away now. And we, we just got the full trailer, Patan, Shah Rukh Khan's return. And who's he starring years. with? Who's he starring with? He's starring with Deepika Padukone and 
John Abraham as the antagonist. Ah. Um, you, you saw the trailer. I did see the trailer. I saw the trailer. What saw, a trailer! I saw was. the trailer when it premiered. Yeah. Twelve thirty at night. The countdown happened on YouTube. You watched it yes. live? <laughs> Absolutely. That's that's a dedication <laughs> to the podcast right there. So, for anyone who hasn't seen it, um, go ahead and watch. It's uh, it's two minutes of just craziness going on on screen <laughs> it's, just, it's just a non-stop action and these chase sequences and explosions and just you know it's uh, it's 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 gonna be a fun ride uh in theaters um questions i have about the movie though oh i'm so excited i have so many questions please tell yeah. me what are so your questions? okay the thing that always sticks out and i think it's it's we're at a stage in in filmmaking and in uh in the film industry in general um where um cgi is I, th- I don't think bad CGI is ever forgivable anymore. No. Or even, I would say even medium to decently good CGI is barely for- forgivable Yeah. in this internet. Are, so, you, are, you, are you saying that the CGI in this movie looks... Similar? No, I'm not. I'm saying that I'm hoping it doesn't in the theaters. Ah, okay. Okay, so I have, my concern is, so, because I don't, I think when, you know, Avatar just released. Mm-hmm. Um, Marvel, the Marvel universe has been going for years. Um, and people are used to a standard. People are used to a standard. Yeah. And you know, if you're here or you're in India, you're also Marvel's released there. Avatar's say, released yeah. there. Yeah. You're also used to a kind of standard. And not not to mention that um, uh, a few months ago, a, a movie released in India called Brahmastra, which was which is their first, you know, kind of very bad CGI on that. And no, it's great CGI. Oh, really? They used um, the same the actual. Uh, CGI that did the CGI for Interstellar. I should say, I haven't watched the movie. Yeah. All I've seen is trailers. Yeah. Uh, and I guess when you watch it on YouTube on a computer, it's not yeah. designed for that. No, it's good CGI. Uh, I will, we'll give it, the, the movie got criticized for other reasons, but the CGI always stuck, okay. stood out in that So do you, think, do you think this will hold up then? So uh, this time? obviously this one hasn't put that kind of budget into CGI. No. no. So n- not at all. No. Um, so... I'm 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 hoping we don't like it's it's a big banner film it's YRF right yeah short film so yeah I think they put that they took the CGI budget and invested it in Shah Rukh Khan and John Abraham's abs because uh, <laughs> yeah. those guys look absolutely ripped so that's a question I have going in yeah because okay they still have they still have two weeks to go whatever and post production editing it goes on until quite a quite, it does go quite up, late it does go quite late yeah but for like movie, I I'm, I'm pretty sure avatar itself a couple of days before was uh the premiere happened just for the actors because uh, everything was finalized very very close to the release date yeah and it's not like back in the day where you'd have to actually ship like a physical disc to the um theater yeah before they played it now it's all digital right so theoretically just like music albums where they're editing it to like 11 59 when they have to turn it in at midnight to the label yeah same thing yeah so i wouldn't be surprised if there are changes to it but I think we should uh, we should discuss a little bit more about the content of the trailer because yeah. I wanna I wanna look at the message I sent you after I watched it, which in that two and a half minute trailer I think I've seen inspiration from Mission Impossible, James Bond, Fast and the Furious, Speed, and I think there was some fighting like some Krav Maga fighting that was definitely from like the you know when Bourne goes up on like the necks mm, and like flips people yeah, over like that yeah. kind of stuff yeah, yeah. that that looked like. Yeah, there's there there's influence. There's there's a lot that you can relate to, especially like the music vibe that you get. I think of Fast and Furious. Yeah. Um, the clothing too. The clothing. Like, yeah. Fast Five when they're in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true, 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 yeah, true. yeah. Um. Yeah. So I think okay, it's gonna be a very straightforward plotline. This is not a movie you're gonna go to. It's it's kind of oh, like yeah, talk, there's gonna know. be a MacGuffin. You have to get the MacGuffin. It's like a, a yeah. database or a missile code or something, and they have to make a plan to get it. And then there's gonna be a, a twist. Yeah, someone else gets that, and it's yeah. actually a different villain. Yeah, yeah. And so then... there's gonna be there's gonna be something going on there. Yeah. But like, I mean, it's gonna be a pretty standard. Um, they've like I think it's um, I I don't want to say it's um coincidental. I think it's very much you know, uh, a, a choice by Shah Rukh Khan to come back after four years with a movie that's not only just like over the top action fun, but at the same time, like very patriotic. I, I think it also doesn't take a lot of brain power to understand probably. Yeah. So it's so not it's like just, high concept. He you know? wants people to come and just like, and you know, that, that, but that's what I mean. Like the, the content has to be good. And I think from what we see in the trailer, if they execute the things that they've shown glimpses in the trailer of, if they can execute those things mm-hmm. uh, properly, 
then we can see some good content, I think. Um, I, it's, I, I have a feeling it's going to be a big hit just because of the things that you've mentioned and people like to see a spectacle. Yeah. That's what we talked about with Way of Water too, right? Exactly. It's a spectacle. People yeah. want to see spectacle. Yeah. Uh, but with, with that being said, we should also mention who's the female lead of the film? Deepika Padukone. And what's the age difference between her and Shah Rukh Khan? She is in her mid thirties, uh-huh. and he would—he's fifty-seven. Interesting difference. But he also, but see, this is not. Uh, well, okay, we don't know what we don't know. We haven't seen the movie yet, so we don't know. But um, from the looks of it, it's not a romantic. It's supposed to be like a partnership. It's a partnership in terms of. She's I, I, also I, an intelligent. Exactly. Intelligence agent. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean. Does that evolve into something? Maybe it does. I mean, the, that, that song that came out. Well, personally, I would love to say you said this is going to be a universe, right? Yeah. So why not use this as a backdoor to her own movie where she's a spy? Exactly. exactly. That would be cool. That would be cool. And then you know, it would also be awesome her not having to be in like a relationship. She could be a spy. She yeah. could have a song with dudes or whatever, but she could be doing it to get information. Or You don't have, yeah. you're a spy. You, know? yeah. you don't need to be dating people. So what they didn't also show in the trailer and what they're going to, uh, what they're claiming is going to be in the movie anyway, um, or what people are anticipating is um, Salman Khan. Salman Khan and a cameo by Salman Khan, mm-hmm. which I think is guaranteed. Probably. I think that's I think that's yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, but I uh, also cameo by Ritik Roshan because this is he's oh, also part of the, the the movie that came out in twenty nineteen. War is part of the spy universe. Yeah. Um. So yeah, but um, okay, but back to Deepika Padukone. They made their. Uh, she made her debut with Shah Rukh Khan in that 2007 Om Shanti Om. Yeah, long time ago. Long time yeah. ago. Long time. Both ago. of their so, lives have changed significantly. Very since much then. since then. Yeah, very much. And she's like a huge star. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, huge star for sure. So January 25th, we're gonna see it and have our reviews up for that um, ASAP. Actually. Yeah, and before before we we stop talking in the masala minute, I wanna make a a little bet with Omar. Omar, I'm willing to bet you that this film will have a post credit scene. What do you think? It does have a post credit. It does. Yes. They've already said so. Oh uh, yes. I oh so. damn. Okay, I haven't read it because I was like, if they're trying to build like a film universe, they're yeah. gonna drop a Marvel like, like yeah, some, yeah. Some, some someone yeah. stays alive. As or... far as I I know, I I I believe I have read there is a a post credit. It would be great if they pitch the next villain in the post credit scene. Is yeah. Actually, some like you know in James Bond when the first couple of movies it's individual villains and then you find out oh it was actually a bigger villain specter yep. or whatever the whole time something like that. yeah yeah for sure so there, there we, we will see that and um yeah i'm well we're also interested to see what johnny brown does as the as the villain yeah. so what is what is the mcguffin what is the mcguffin <laughs> we'll find out well, we'll, we'll january 25th <laughs> theater near you <laughs> <laughs> experience uh, it in IMAX. Yeah, even if you don't speak Hindi, uh, just go. Yeah. Subtitles, um, yeah, enjoy it, the spectacle. Uh, so, all right, after, uh, let's uh, let's shift into our next topic, which is uh, trading movies, Omer. Uh, so last week, I gave you the homework to watch the 1993 political conspiracy crime thriller, is what I'm going to call it, Pelican Brief. Starring um, a fan favorite, Julia Roberts, uh, co-starring with Denzel Washington. And then there's a whole host of other folks, uh, including Stanley Tucci. Um, budget of $45 million, Box office, $195 million, Very successful. It's 140 minutes, so not, not very, very long. And the director is Alan J. Pakula. So let's start, Omer, with what were your thoughts of the movie? It or was, actually, wait, before we get into that, should we should we give a little rundown of the plot? Yeah, let's do a little rundown of the plot. Um, I'll give that to you. So the movie is a conspiracy thriller where there is um, an individual who has two uh, Supreme Court justices assassinated. And it turns out that these Supreme Court justices were in the way of him potentially drilling a bunch of oil. Now, that's the conspiracy. The story is... A young law student figures out this conspiracy. She writes a brief. It makes its way up all the way to the White House. And shenanigans ensue where, because it's a very valuable, um, you know, deal that this business person wants to have, uh, people come after her, people chase her. And then Denzel Washington, as Gray Grantham, the reporter, assists her in getting her story out. And yeah, so I'll turn it over to you. What did you think as your first time watching this? Few things. The few there's few things about this movie. Okay, so one as a political conspiracy, as like a as as a movie based on uh, a lot of uh, a political political conspiracy. I feel like it's a bit slow to start. Yeah. Just just because you need that you need 
like it takes time. I mean, for me, anyway, like, I, I guess there might be people out there who are really into political dramas, political yeah. conspiracies, po- movies but, or surrounding politics. But when I'm when I'm presented with a movie right off the bat and I'm seeing, OK, like White House conversations, uh, general conversations, yeah. uh, secretary conversations, uh, presidents being shown in this conversations, I'm like, OK, OK, cool. You're uh, seeing what's... a bunch of white guys in suits. You exactly. Don't know exactly. Yeah. And I'm just like, OK, I, they're having these conversations that don't mean don't mean anything to anyone right now Mm -hmm. because we're just being introduced um and then we have julia roberts coming in and eventually giving her um um you know she she's her introduction her introduction with the professor and she's kind of involved in this or interested in this intrigued in this case um so it took i would say a half hour for me to like get into the story yeah uh but once you get in it's it's a fun ride yeah and Exactly what you just said, Omer, is yeah. why it's such a great, great movie to come back to. Because yeah. once you understand the plot yeah. and you watch it a second time, you notice all of the intricacies and the little details and the, oh, these guys were positioning this way right from the start. Because there's a couple of different threads in the plot, right? And and when you watch it a second time or a third time, you really start to recognize how they're, they're interwoven right from the start of the movie. Um I've, I, I've watched this movie a handful of times. I've had the pleasure of reading the book before I actually watched the movie. So I'm a huge, huge fan. I, I've always thought Denzel Washington is, oh, yeah. is just fantastic. fantastical. Like, this is so the good. youngest I've seen him in a movie. Really? I don't, I can't, I'm trying to remember if I've seen another 90s film of his, uh, and I must have, but he's, I mean, he looks really young in this movie yeah. and I haven't seen a Denzel that young in, I, I don't, I don't remember seeing a Denzel that young in a movie. Um, so that was crazy. Also, um, the, <laughs> for, okay, for me, it was uh, the president. Yeah. What a <laughs> what a role, right? He's so creepy looking. The smiles and so stuff. So he is um he is if I'm not mistaken uh Deborah's father from Everybody Loves Raymond. Oh, really? Deborah's father. I mean, I believe <laughs> I believe so so, someone can fact check me there, but I, I was like it took me a while to take him seriously because of that. Because there, I had his image as a certain character in that show, and I'm seeing him as the president in this movie. And he had the, oh, he did like peace signs and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, and... so that's <laughs> that's what I loved about this was, so he's the president, but he's yeah. obviously like a puppet of, yeah. of his of his main henchman. Yes. Um, so like, there's that one scene when he's near the front where um, he gets the news that two Supreme Court justices have passed away, and uh, his his henchman is like maybe you should wear a cardigan. You know, you're giving this news at yeah. breakfast. And he's like, I'm not wearing a cardigan. And then the next scene is him in the background on the TV wearing a cardigan as he tells people, like, yes, two Supreme Court justices have died. Yeah. And that's only something you'll notice if you watch the movie a bunch of times. But it shows you right off the top that this guy's a he's being controlled, right? Yeah. He's being completely ran by by his uh by his main advisor, who I believe is played by Tony Goldwyn, and he plays such an excellent evil person. Mm, like he's yeah. got that really like clean cut jaw, and he just looks like something looks yeah. like someone you want to punch in the face. Yes, right. Exactly the exact look. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like that the, the Matrix look. Yeah, like a, the guys from the Matrix and an the white, in the in the, yeah, the agents in the, in the, yeah. the sunglasses on. Yeah, it's that look. So, um, in terms of the development of this movie, I thought there was there were a couple of interesting things I thought you'd be interested in. Uh, so, a like I mentioned already, it was it was developed by. Um, it was developed by uh, or written by John Grisham. And here's what's interesting about this. The movie before or the book before it even came out, the director had purchased the rights for it because John Grisham was a hot novelist and a bunch of his books were turning into movies, including, um, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, The Firm by Tom Cruise yes. or with Tom Cruise and uh, Rainmaker with Matt Damon, both John Grisham novels that okay. um, became movies. So I don't think this will happen again where there's a writer who's on such a hot streak where someone buys his novel before it's even out to yeah. make a movie. I can't, I can't imagine one novelist who that would happen to right now. Like it, ha- it would have to be, it'd have to be like George R.R. Martin saying, or like starting a Stephen a new- King maybe. Yeah. But even yeah. then, like Stephen King writes so many books. Yeah, that yeah, it's right, like, so, yeah. it's not going to happen. True. Um, and then the other piece, which I, again, I found really interesting was according to the, to the author of the novel, um, he, wanted julia roberts from the start and apparently he wrote the character when he was writing the novel with julia roberts in mind like that's who he thought of when he was writing her that's really interesting and the fact that she plays the character so well yeah like she's just, a great character man yeah she's a great character even though she's going through so much like trauma through like she saw like that scene where she sees what happens to her boyfriend oh, slash the oh, professor, yeah, yeah. her reaction is so genuine it's really genuine and yeah. and 
after like the next 10 minutes where she has clearly been affected by it, you can really, that's when you see her like prime acting chops. Exactly. But also when, um, when she's trying to get around, when she's trying to find information, when mm-hmm. she's scared to tell anyone anything, when she's, you know, you can, there's so much realism. Her, in her wig. Performance. Her, yeah, yeah. It's, there's so much, it's just, you don't, you, you don't look at the screen thinking this is someone acting. It just feels like how you would react in those situations. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't think it was, oh, Julia Roberts. I was like, oh, that's Darby Shaw. Yeah, that, exactly. That's a lost exactly. student who just, 24 years old, who just lost her boyfriend slash professor, which, yeah. side note, I've been to university never experienced that before kind of weird <laughs> yes <true. laughs> it seems, seems like really normal in movies like oh yeah the professor no that's not normal <laughs> I, mean, I feel like it was even more normal um in some older movies yeah yeah they, they, they this, really make it seem like oh this is casual. this is just whatever yeah, yeah. yeah. no oh. not true <laughs> um some other some other interesting bits about the, the book in the movie so gray grantham denzel washington's character um is white in, in oh, okay. the, the book so i mean it's it doesn't affect the character at all no. but it was cool to I mean, see Denzel, Denzel Washington. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, just awesome. Uh, and then the other piece was apparently in the script, uh, Gray Grantham and Darby Shaw are supposed to kiss, but Denzel Washington said he didn't want to, he wanted to avoid upsetting his main fans, which were black women. So he didn't kiss her in the film. Is that the reason? It's from a Guardian interview I saw from the early 2000s. I, I thought you were about to say he didn't want to like his girlfriend. Or no, whatever, no. Whatever apparently, girlfriend apparently he or... wanted like because at that time, I, even though I don't know how real this is, uh, the interracial kissing on scene, even though it happened way back in the 60s, it still wasn't as common as even as, as it is now. But that was a reason that he quoted to the Guardian. At, that's where I saw it. But I think it was another magazine player. Wow. Which is interesting when you think about it, but also I don't think those two characters need to be like romantically involved. They don't. I mean, they don't need to, but the vibes were. Oh yeah, they were totally into each other. Yeah, the vibes were there. There was that one scene where, um, where she's about to head out and he's like hugging her. Yeah, and it looks like they're about to kiss, but then she runs back to him, and I was like, oh, here's, here comes their kiss scene, and no, it's just a hug. Or when when he meets her for the first time and she's she's like, do you mind just like staying? And like, can you sleep on the couch? Because I'm scared. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then I was also like, yeah, like, but nothing ever really happened between yeah. them apart from they were, it was just like, it was like told that there's a vibe here, but we're not going to take it any further. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But for a movie that's like two hours, more than two hours, two hours, 20 minutes long, uh, definitely has a lot of interesting cinematic decisions and choices. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of um the director's other work like particularly all the president's men but there's a lot of influence from those movies in these ones particularly mm-hmm. there's one scene i want to talk about which is when they're in the underground parking lot and the guy comes and plants the bomb in their car and then that whole scene afterwards where you know they get the papers yeah. from the bank and then and then he's about to turn yeah, and, and, then, yeah. and then the chase that scene is almost exactly like not lifted but very much inspired by a scene from all the president's men uh, which is about the Watergate scandal. Okay. Um, and it's they meet their main source from inside the scandal in the underground garage. And it's like a super high pressure situation, mm. just like this scene is. I'm like, yeah, this guy knows this parking Man, and this one, when he was like, t- turning t- like three or four times, he turned the key and she's like, no, wait, stop. You know, that's, that's what I, so that's another piece, right? Yeah. Where she, what, what does the camera do there? It focuses on her, like grabbing his hand and like yeah. being, oh, look, and I'm like, that's such an intimate move yeah. that she that they're doing. And it's clearly signifying some kind of intimacy between them. Yeah. But they don't go the full romance. Yeah, they don't, yeah, they don't go the full romance. It's just two people who are running for their lives because they're they know something's wrong, but no one believes them. Yeah. I guess I guess in a way it's they're trying to be a bit realistic about it. Yeah. I mean, when you're in the situation that Darby was in, for example, mm-hmm. um, are you really th- are you, like you're, you're like I, I don't know if I'm gonna make it to my 25th birthday? Yeah, and are you really thinking about getting with the guy instead of no exactly finding exactly? How to survive? That's my whole point. Yeah. Like, why would you even write it with a romance involved? Yeah. You're yeah. the whole thing is like you're trying to stay alive. Yeah, you've known that these people have murdered. They murdered two Supreme Court justices. Yeah. what do they care about you? And exactly, your like, you're, you're a, a very expendable target. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you do not matter. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's interesting. So maybe uh, <laughs> I just I just find that so dumb that they're like, yeah, let's let's make them a romantic. <laughs> it's a man and a woman. What do you mean? They're alone. They should be together. It's so dumb. Um, so let's take a break and then we can jump into a little bit more uh, yep. on the back end here. All right, and we're back. Uh, so Omar, a couple more things I want to talk about before we get into the awards uh, for the show. 
Uh, first, did you notice how a lot of the main violence, shooting people, etc., happens off screen and we only kind of see like a splatter of blood? Yes. Kind of interesting choice. Very interesting choice. Especially during that scene. Remember when uh, Darby is visiting at that like fair or whatever? The, the, uh, yes. Or he's, he, and at, she's holding hands with the terrorist. She's holding hands with the terrorist and he puts that gun like through his suit jacket or something yeah. and ends up killing himself or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um you don't see like it, it just all of a sudden happening all you see is blood yeah and and you kind of if you haven't seen the movie before you're kind of like wait what just happened yeah right? you're kind of surprised by it uh and funnily enough um stanley tucci he kills um the professor's friend or he he is the professor's friend um darby's boyfriend's friend yes um do you know who that character is what other movie he comes in which one um the fbi the fbi lawyer who who kamel kills and then replaces to come visit uh darby at the fair yeah do you know who who else he plays kevin McAllister's dad in home alone oh yes yeah that's, <laughs> yeah that's, that's him that's that is him. him and he plays like yeah. a so that's another great scene when he's getting ready to go meet darby and kamel is inside of the closet and all you see is a reflection of the closet door the mirror and then it's slowly opening and yeah. then you just see the bullet and that's it and he dies and you don't you don't see any of the actual violence in the movie. It's just kind of, it's always a little bit off screen. And I thought that was just an interesting decision artistically. Yeah, yeah. it's always, even, yeah, even the scene where he, yeah, cause it's, uh, it, I think it was blood spotted on a mirror or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, it's it's a, it's a an artistic flourish, which, yep. um, cool, good on you. Do do more of that, directors. Yeah. Uh, it could also be to, I believe- the, Keep the rating. Keep the rating at 14A or whatever it was, yeah. whatever the rating was, uh, it, I think, um, that many murders or something and that much because they're, they're, they don't swear all that much they don't swear i'm trying to remember when they use the f word and stuff i think it'd be here and there yeah but yeah it's not uh, yeah. it's not a crazy amount uh the other piece i wanted to touch or touch on is <laughs> we've talked about him a couple of times stanley tucci very <laughs> handsome man but let's talk about hiring an italian person <laughs> To play an Arab terrorist. Stuff that was okay in the 90s, I don't know. Yeah. He doesn't he doesn't particularly look like okay, and I know, you know, you can be you can be from a different nationality, not necessarily look, yeah. you know, stereotypical, but man, he does not look like a terrorist yeah, yeah, in no, Kamel. No, no, he does not. <laughs> it, yeah, I didn't yeah, I gotta say it doesn't fit the vibe. No, but but I'll appreciate that he was really good at changing his voice and yes. his appearance. Yeah. And particularly that scene when he kills the second Supreme Court justice in the adult theater. Yeah. That was it's very well done. Like he looks completely different. Yeah. Right. He looks completely different and he looks he I think there's four or five different um personalities he kind of takes on in the in the movie. He's like a jogger, he's obviously an assassin, he he plays, um, you know, Darby Shaw's contact. He puts on the fake weight stuff and yeah. adjusts his voice. Yeah. And, and he does, he takes all of those, he takes all of those tips that you would consider someone like a spy or something would do. Yeah. So it seems like realistic as much as we two amateurs who have nothing to do with this would think about. Yeah. Uh, so I thought his character was definitely interesting. Yeah. Got like zero lines. <laughs> I think he just said, yes, hello. Thank you. And that's yeah, it. Do, that's all he yeah, did. Yeah. Was, was the only scene I remember him saying anything was when he was imitating that guy's voice. And when he ordered room service. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. That's it. Those are like his main lines. Yeah. So that's all I remember him saying. Yeah. So anyways, those, those are the last couple of things I wanted to touch on before we get into our awards. So let's start with, uh, Let's start with the best sequence. What did you think was the best sequence of the movie? Ooh, best sequence of the movie. Um, I did like when sh- they crept into the hospital, to the rehab center. Yeah. Um, to see, I forgot his name now, uh, but what was that? When they were trying to get information on someone, and then Denzel goes into the the office she creeps in she goes in and then on her way out doctor sees her and she's and like oh it's my sister my, my brother my brother oh. yeah they were trying to find out the identif- identity of garcia the lawyer yeah. uh, they wanted to find out which law firm he worked yeah. on and what floor and i think that's where they find out he's an oil and gas lawyer yeah there you go and yeah. it confirms their their conspiracy so a, a bunch of the the scenes where they're trying to gather the information uh you know bring bring ends together um i like that stuff yeah. I like those sequences. That, the sequence when she goes in, um, uh, I, I believe it was the um, uh, where was this? Uh, it was oh, it was the um, uh, it was some uh, center, 
and she's trying to find information on someone that like oh no he's uh he's he's he, he's dead or something or long no longer oh you're talking about uh, when she did the freedom of information yeah, 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 yeah. And exactly. she goes to the courthouse and so she gets ex- all the information it's funny because a lot of this movie like the book is based on darby just doing research yeah right and same thing with greg Grantham. he's a journalist he's just doing research but they make it look not boring when we have written enough research papers. We know it's pretty boring. Yes. Right? <laughs> and, and they make it seem like, oh, whoa, this is so cool. Like, yeah, yeah. Pulling out, finding that, finding the answer is the first try. It's amazing. And it like, happens right away for them. Exactly. And, you know, they, they find the right book that shows the right information. But it gets you invested in, <laughs> in, in, faster, in, yeah. in the adventure. Like, the point is not to put the audience to research. Just, to... <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> just repeatedly <laughs> failing to find yeah. a source and just over and over again. Um, in, my, in my opinion, I thought my, my favorite sequence was I thought artistically was Kamel in the theater. I thought the way they framed the popcorn and then he moves the popcorn and you just see a rope, like he's wearing a rope as a belt and then he unhooks that. Yeah. And then just, you're like, oh my God, this guy just did this. Like you just, you just pulled it out of nowhere and just killed a dude. Yeah. That's insane. But I think my favorite scene, the one that I would rewatch again is the chase through New Orleans. Yes. Um, oh, when yeah. she's on foot and like, sh- again, can't speak enough about Julia Roberts as Darby Shaw, but you can see the pain the anguish but more importantly the fear in her eyes yes an unknown dude who clearly is capable of killing people is chasing you yeah. through new orleans and there's all these people partying and you know being inebriated and you're asking for help and no one cares until that big man comes See, that, that's what that, but that's what, what i also found funny it was like she there was a couple of times when she, sequences when she was running through like crowds of people yeah. yet no one like paid it any attention but you know that 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 seems to be people claim that that happens all the time, right? But like this is this is a woman clearly running away from a man, <laughs> a man. who is after her, like chasing her, and no one's twenty twenty two. That would not be allowed. Nineteen ninety three. They're like, oh, I just playing tag. Oh, but yeah, so but it's so weird. And, and there's clearly there's as you said, there's clear anguish on her face. Yeah, there's clear fear, and you know, fright. She's frightened like nothing else, and. Everyone's just like getting about like no one's like oh what's going on oh look that guy's chasing her he's right behind her so in my in my in my head canon I always thought that he was far enough away from her where you could see her running but you can't see him and then you can see him running but you don't know who he's chasing that, to, that's not yeah. realistic but it's that not, was my head canon yeah. at least so that yeah uh, but yeah that was my my favorite sequence I thought this movie I know we've talked about it before but it was really well directed and the cinematography the shots were really really. I, I just thought they were interesting. He really took different angles um, that you wouldn't consider when filming a movie. That's essentially just, it's if it's not people talking in rooms, it's people in, doing research, right? Yeah. So I thought, I thought that was cool. Um, so now let's talk about our most efficient award or Steph Curry award. This is, this goes to the person uh, or character who had the least amount of screen time, but you know, had the most impact bang for your buck. Who did you think that would be in this, in this uh, movie? Can I give it to the president? <laughs> <laughs> so you can totally give it to the president. He's played by Robert Culp. Uh, what an interesting character. First of all, that creepy smile. Yeah. So creepy. And But like, the reason, I'll, the reason I'll give it to him is because, see, that character could have been really boring. Yeah. And every sequence he was in could have been just a drag. Yeah. Could have just been like, yeah, yeah, whatever, in the White House, or just talking their crap or whatever, you know, like... Um, these, uh, but like, he looked at him on screen when he like he seemed to make things a little interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I thought him in the hospital was so funny yeah. when 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 he's like talking to the taking a picture first of all, and then he's like, yeah, tell tell the sergeant at arms it's a golf day, and then and then, and then you know his advisor comes and gives him the bad news, and what does he do? He's like, oh damn, this is bad news. Goes out to the window, gives a peace sign to the fans, yeah. like gets some pictures. He's like, okay, this makes me feel a little better. It felt like very Trumpy. Yeah, like yeah. something. Trump-y. So it just made like it, it just made that whole aspect of the movie. And I think it was probably done. It was creative choice. I think do it that way, just because those scenes can get dry. Yeah, and and yeah, he's also like they frame it. He's, he's the bad guy, but they make it a little. Oh, I don't know if it's intentionally comedy, like if it's tongue in cheek. But there yeah. are some the way the way the the president acts is kind of like a toddler yeah yeah exactly. right? it's, it's yeah. really funny um i i agree he's he's a great great choice the other um person i thought of was john lithgow who plays gray grantham's uh, editor mm, okay. uh, i thought he was really funny I, he had a lot of good lines and then the whole like 
for some reason, them going to Mount Vernon to Abraham Lincoln's yeah. notes, or George Washington. I can't remember. For some reason, I didn't know what it's George Washington. I don't know what the purpose of that was, but they just did it. Yeah. And I actually, when I was doing research for this podcast, the Mount Vernon website has a web page dedicated to the filming of this movie there. <laughs> and it's from like literally the early 2000s, late 90s. It's so it hasn't oh, changed wow. at all. But yeah, it's like a whole damn behind the scenes picture. Of yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's random. But yeah, John Lithgow, I thought he was definitely, he had some good lines. Like there was that one line in the elevator doors close. And he's like, if I were you, I'd be looking at a place to eat Little Walk. And then yeah, the yeah. I, was like, I was like, that's a good role. He just needed a cigar. And yeah, it yeah, perfect. true. Um, okay, now we'll talk about <coughs> the pièce de résistance, the main award. Who was your MVP of the movie? I mean, it's hard not to give it to Julia Roberts. Thank you. I agree. As Darby Shaw. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I love Denzel. I'll be the first one to watch any Denzel movie that comes out. And every time he's like on screen, I'm like, I love this guy. Um, what I love about him is, in this movie particularly, he knows he's handsome and he uses it yes, for his advantage. Like yes. that scene you talk about when they go to the, uh, yeah. the rehab place. You can tell that the lady who he's talking to is like a little taken aback. You know, like, he's so handsome. Even when he goes to get the student uh, schedules at the yeah. university. Oh, like, look at the handsome guy from, yeah. oh, from journalist. Oh, okay. Uh, he goes to sign those papers at the law firm. She's like, oh, thanks, Mr. Stevens. And it's like, <laughs> oh, you're so in, like, they just love him, you know? Yeah. He, and he, and he, but he knows that. And he's using, as a reporter, he's using his charisma to his advantage to get information. And I just thought, he was he was great in this movie, but you can't not give the MVP to Julia. Yeah, Roberts. I mean we I mean we talked a decent chunk about her performance, but yeah, I mean the realism in her performance, the the um uh, just effortless effortless acting. Yeah, and it just it, it never felt like acting. It just felt like how you would how we ourselves would react in those situations. Yeah, and and even even when she's kind of. The whole movie, she they kind of show her a little bit a step ahead when it comes to the conspiracy. She kind of knows, and she's putting the yeah. pieces together before anyone else, even though it seems pretty obvious. Like yeah. to regular degrees, we're like, hmm, maybe we'd look at what the commonalities are between these two judges. But she seems to catch on to it right off the start, and even that sense of superiority, she doesn't let it get to her head. She's still yeah. on edge, always worried, always looking over her shoulder. And again, you're being chased by grown-ass men with guns and you're supposed to be a like a college maybe what first year law school student yeah i think it's law school first year law school yeah you would be freaking out yes. anyone would be freaking out if yeah. that's the case particularly if you're you know you're not a fully grown adult yet i would anyone would yeah i think uh, i think it's easy to overplay a role like that too um which she did not do no it was play it was played to perfection yeah and again i'll go back to that scene where um her boyfriend slash professor uh gets exploded yes and that her i remember response, seeing a reaction and i was like yeah that's about right <laughs> but, but see the, yeah. the, the difference is it's not like she doesn't drop to her knees and start wailing exactly right? it, it could be overdone that's exactly. what i mean that's, that's what, she could do a lot of things that you're like oh yeah sure that i'm sure someone might do that. but i mean like hers was just you could you could without her dropping on the floor and without her you could see the shock in her face you could yeah. see the terror in her eyes like it's it was pretty it was pretty compelling yeah, but overall, um, I can you see why I like this movie? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really fun time, particularly for people who like politics, a, eh? but also this is kind of a journalism movie. Yes. Uh, you know, chasing the story and all of that stuff. So if you're into those two topics, I would definitely recommend yeah. this movie. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't shy away. I know a lot. Of, I know um, movies that kind of surround around politics or political conspiracies. They may not always appeal to the masses, um, but this I wouldn't shy away from that because um, this is really based on you know the, the characters, and it, it does yeah. have a lot of action. There are chase scenes, yeah, there's, there's, chase scenes there's, there's shootings, there's sequences. Exactly, but it's it's uh, there's a very human aspect to this uh, yeah. to this story, which is uh, which is appealing. So I think that's uh, that's a that's a uniform uh, choice from both the hosts of this podcast that if you haven't, and you live in Canada, the Pelican Reef is available on Netflix. So definitely check it out. So with that being said, Omar, what is my homework for this week? Your homework. Okay. So I, I went with something new. Um, I, I went with a recent release. So a lot of listeners who, um, who are following along with us may or may not have seen this. Um, but you won't have to dig too far back. Um, um, uh, in movie history to find this movie. Um, it is the menu. 
Interesting. Which just released um, uh, near the end of 2022. Um, it had a run in theaters for a little bit. And I picked this movie for a f- couple of reasons. Um, one being, um, if you listen to our podcast last week, we kicked off 2023 uh, talking about upcoming movies. And we also talked uh, quite length in quite length about um, our box office predictions. And if we think the film industry is going to make a comeback and what kind of movies do we see as sticking to more of a streaming service compared to a movie that releases in theaters. Um, And The Menu is one movie that interests me in that aspect as well, because I think this movie had a decent one at the box office. I mean, um, uh, I think the budget wasn't all that crazy, about 30 or so million, I I think, was the budget. I don't think it was anything um, insane. Um, And I think it made a decent amount of money. It definitely made its money back, I would say, and more. Um, But... It had about seven weeks in theaters. It had a, it had a, a. So that's a short amount of time. Exactly. It had about seven weeks in theaters, uh, and then it released straight onto. Uh, and for yeah, for all for all the Canadian listeners, it's on Disney Plus in Canada. Um, so it, it released straight onto Disney Plus seven weeks after after release. So it brings the question to me: When you watch this movie, it's a bit of a mystery, a bit of a suspenseful drama mm-hmm. um and you, i mean it's called the menu so i'm assuming it's food based there's the it's food based yeah. um a little bit um for people who watch or have seen the chef's table yeah um you could find some uh you could have a little bit of fun watching this movie and you'll know what i mean when you watch the movie if you if you're someone who's seen the chef's table um but yeah i want to I want to explore that topic a bit more through this movie because this is one movie where I think you'll watch it. I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll, uh, I would like to, I want to see what your reaction, reaction is at, at, as well to the end of the movie. Okay. Particularly what your reaction is to the end of the movie, as well as what your reaction is to what's going on while you're watching it. Um, and how a movie like this fares coming out in theaters. Okay, the so I'm I'm definitely looking forward to this because it's been on my list to watch, but like it's it was in theaters for not too long, and and I kind of knew it was coming out early, yeah. so I was like, do I need to spend money to go, or can I watch this at home? Yeah, uh, definitely looking forward to engaging with this in terms of theatrical versus at home, because I think that's the bigger that's the bigger debate going forward, right? Yeah. Are you going to go watch the avatars, or are you going to stay at home to watch? The pale blue eye, the pale blue eye, uh, or the menu, yeah, or the glass glass onion, glass onion, um, yeah. So let's uh, let's save our discussion for this movie till next week. Exactly. Uh, if you'd like to play along and follow along with us, please go ahead and watch the menu this week. And if you haven't, check out the Pelican Brief and then listen to this podcast again. I'm sure you'll have a lot of thoughts. But uh, that's about it for this week uh, for the podcast. I'm Janaid. I'm Omar, and we'll see you next time. Bye, bye, guys.